grace to you and peace in the name of the triune God, Trinity of love, who made us, who saves us, and who keeps us, who has given us this mi ministry and this life, and in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. Meeting God in nature, even in air, I am grateful that air is all around us today, that air is all around us every day. I have met God in the air of many places, far-flung places, and the winds of the Holy Spirit have blown in each of those places. And those winds continue to blow right here, now among us. The writer Kurt Vonnegut said, peculiar travel suggestions are dancing lessons from God. I have been in awe of the truth of that statement from when I included it in my ordination bulletin as I move, prepared to move to Holden Village for my first call and ever since. Peculiar travel suggestions are dancing lessons from God and the winds of the Holy Spirit have propelled those travels even to this very place, I believe. Today is July 23rd, and that date is, and was when I was ordained on this date, the commemoration day for St. Brigida of Sweden. Little did I know back then that I would later serve in ministry in Sweden. St. Brigida lived in the 1300s. She went on a number of pilgrimages to sacred sites during her life. And when her husband died in 1344, she began to live a more ascetic life. Her visions became stronger and she devoted more of her time and effort to helping the needy of Sweden and later of Rome. Brigida established herself as one of the leading voices in the political and religious debates of the time. She founded an order of monks and nuns centered at the monastery she started at Vadstena in Sweden. And after her death, that order spread widely in Europe. The cloister at Vadstena was one of the most important cultural and religious centers of Sweden during the Middle Ages. In 1340, Brigida walked the pilgrimage to Nidaros. Nidaros is the cathedral in Trondheim, Norway, where Saint Olaf was buried. She walked barefooted on that pilgrimage. I walked eight days of that pilgrimage after serving as a pastor for 18 years, but I kept my shoes on. <laughs> in the Middle Ages, pilgrimages were about sacrifice, forgiveness, a journey to Jerusalem, either literally or metaphorically, imitating Christ's suffering. In our postmodern, post-reformation world, we have left behind medieval ideas of earning forgiveness through bodily punishment. But I wonder about sacrifice. Are we being called to consider anew the ways we might make sacrifices for the sake of the common good. We are in the midst of a two month festival here at Good Shepherd focused on our eco love for God's creation. The earth, the seas, the mountains, the waters, the air, all God's creatures and all that God has made. Care for creation in our present day requires both technological innovation that isn't coming fast enough, and it requires sacrifice. As we see all around us, the heating up of our world as creation is literally burning up in various places, we know that something's gotta give, as the saying goes. What all will need to give or be given up? I just read about the Washington State Ferries and the plans to convert them to hybrid electric power and the plans to build electric powered ones as well. And the high costs of it all are slowing it all down. That's a story being repeated all over the world. 
Will we be willing to redirect expenditures collectively? And dare we say it, are we willing to change some of our consumer habits, even consuming less? Making sacrificial choices more and more or for the first time for the sake of our neighbors and the whole creation is at hand. What needs to give? What can we give? What new approaches can we take up? As we reflect on our eco-love, our love of God's whole creation, we give thanks for the ways we do indeed meet God in nature, in fire, water, air, and earth. We have amazing mountaintop experiences in nature. This love of nature is something that is especially vivid in the lives of people in the Pacific Northwest. So we at Good Shepherd decided to connect with this in this sermon series. We can and do meet God in nature. Yet we are very aware that there is in these days also a longing for belonging, for community, for intergenerational connections of care and deep meaning. When I was first called as, uh, when I first served on the summer staff at Holden Village in my post-college days, I recall the director, John Schramm, saying, as I remember it, mountaintop experiences are great, but it is also true that a tree or a rock never said, take up your cross and follow me. <laughs> he was talking about the kind of prophetic call we hear from Jesus to act and sacrifice for the sake of the neighbor and the whole creation. Since those years when I was first at Holden, the, crea the creation has now been speaking to us very loudly. And the creation's cries are getting louder every month and year. Many people are experiencing the travails of the creation as a call to us to listen. Many people are, are anguished in deep existential spiritual ways about the creation's degradation. Many people are working to respond, as so many were at our eco-fair yesterday. And we know that there is a yearning for communities of meaning-making in the face of all these great cultural shifts all around us. When I served in Stockholm, Sweden, there was a deep spiritual hunger among people who weren't in churches. And I discovered that some of that had to do with the state church that was not very vital at the time. And that same discovery of spiritual hunger, living in many people who aren't in churches, shaped my years serving in St. Paul, Minnesota, as we reached out to hungry minds and souls as we spoke of our mission. Some of you remember that in the 1960s, there was a lot of talk that God was dead. Now some people are saying that God is making a comeback in the greatly varied ways people understand God. But now some are wondering about the death of the church as churches have been shrinking both before and after COVID. Churches have been suffering for a number of years now which all calls us to continue to reflect on how to live out our basic mission as churches, considering new forms and approaches in these new days as we continue to invite people into the Christian faith and life lived in community, our core mission. Without openness to evolving, we can simply hold on to what we have until all of our churches die or we can dig into the possibilities for both innovation and sacrifice, just as we are discovering in our care for our suffering creation. Which brings me to today's reading from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians. 
This was one of the scripture readings in my ordination service, and I still am drawn to it. Paul writes that the gifts given to pastors and all kinds of leaders are given by God so that we can equip God's people, the saints, for their work of ministry. There it is, shared ministry. It's about being in this together. Thank you for being co-ministers in this congregation and in your daily lives and all around this South Sound area. And the Apostle Paul also writes that we must no longer be blown about by every wind of doctrine. Oh, a different wind other than the Holy Spirit's wind. What winds of doctrine blow us about? I think of strong winds in our culture like our idolatry of comfort, our love of consumerism, our sense of entitlement about our own privilege, and the ways we have become habituated to being cut off from one another, knowing very few people in deep ways. The winds of the Holy Spirit call us to, in the words of Paul, bear with one another in love, being one body together. When I read this passage in these days, I hear in it the Good Shepherd tagline, be seen, be heard, belong. Bear with one another in love, being one body together. So here we are together listening for God's guidance as we seek to follow Jesus who calls us from death into resurrection, who shows us new life day by day, who shows us how to take up our cross to follow the way of self-sacrifice for the sake of love, for the sake of the love of neighbor and the whole creation. This is the way of Jesus, a way so needed now and always. All pastors and servants of the gospel have had to sacrifice the idea that they learned everything they needed to know in seminary and now they can just coast. <laughs> there is no such thing as coasting. If a pastor leader is to have integrity and there is no such thing as not continuing to learn and grow as the spiritual landscape and the lives of God's people are ever evolving. This has certainly been my experience in ministry. And all congregations have had to sacrifice the idea that if we are here, they will come. Congregations have had to sacrifice focusing on preserving the privileges, patterns, and trappings they had, they had previously as churches. Thank you, for, thank you, Good Shepherd, for your commitment to turn yourself inside out, to look out toward the spiritually hungry people all around, reaching out with justice making and invitations, spending our time, our talents, and our treasures on gospel invitations more than ever before. Thank you for your faithfulness to the tasks, the sacrifices, and the deep calling to redevelopment and revitalization. As we read, every 24 hours, God creates something new out of earth, air, fire, and water. Every morning we wake up to something that never was before and never will be again. And the you that wakes up was never the same before and will never be the same again either. Will the air we breathe on this earth become unbreathable and therefore no longer an experience of the Holy Spirit moving in and among us? We pray and act and sacrifice to ensure that those who come after us will have clean air to breathe. Will the future have churches where people can be seen, be heard, and belong. We pray and act and sacrifice to ensure that those who come after us will continue to be invited into the Christian faith and life lived in community. When I was installed here at Good Shepherd, I was asked, as all pastors are asked in installation services, this question. Will you love, serve, and pray for God's people? 
How many of us get to have a job where love is written into our job description? <laughs> That's part of the privilege, I feel, in serving as a pastor. But we know that love is a part of the job description of all of us as followers of Jesus. To love, serve, and pray for all of God's people. We know that love can be risky business. Love makes us vulnerable to hurt or betrayal, whether it be in our closest relationships or in churches or in the fragile fabric of our wider communities. Yet we seek to love and serve and pray for God's people. That's the privilege of the ministry of all of us. It is a holy calling to serve in ministry with you in this pivotal time for Good Shepherd and this pivotal time for our creation as we join together in love, service, and prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.